Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Browser Hacking. Today, we are going to look a little bit at twitter.com in the browser because I just got it actually loading earlier today. So if I open my Twitter page, then um, it's going to use a fair amount of CPU just to load. And let's get the system monitor here. We can see that um, first up, it's protocol server doing a whole bunch of stuff, and then we crashed. Okay, let's try again. This is not very stable. Um, okay, so we got proto server, protocol server spinning up. Um, let's get a, a super user monitor here so we can actually see what it's doing. All right, we died again. <laughs> Dang it. All right, one more time, come on now. Um, so protocol server, what are you doing? It's doing a lot of crypto, looking pretty heavy. Um, so definitely room for improvement there. Uh, I think we could probably also maybe keep a connection open instead of making multiple. That might be um, really useful here. And then let's see, now it looks like it's parsing at least. Okay, so now we are in browser instead, doing a whole bunch of stuff, but we are loading. Um, oh, there we go, check it out. It's kind of Twitter. Um, now, obviously it's, it's very broken um, and it's also extremely prone to high CPU usage. So uh, this is as far as I got before. So I thought that uh, what we could do is we could we could save a um, snapshot of this. I mean, <laughs> as much of a snapshot as we can really save here. Um, I don't know what's going on back here. And then let's see, we'll get a text editor. Paste that. Man, the system is really suffering. <laughs> um, let's see, what's even going on here? Yeah, it's just like extremely actively doing um, something. But I just want to save a local copy so that we can um, we can mess around with that instead of having to wait for it to connect that much. It's just now it's taking for frickin' ever to paste here. <laughs> um, maybe there's an easier way to do this. Okay, let's do this a different way. Uh, let's use the um, protocol server testing tool for this. So we'll kill you. And now, what's even taking all that time? Well, we can do a pro twitter.com awesome cling to a there we go. At least that's loading, so that's cool. All right, so then we can actually skip this because this appears to have uh, completely failed anyway. All right, and then let's see what happens if we open up the saved version in the browser. All right, so he gets a little bit sad. I guess he's loading remote resources still, but at least at least maybe only CSS and JavaScript. Um, it's still slow. Okay, I guess we can profile the protocol server, see what it's doing. Um, maybe next time since he finished or did he? Yes. Okay, so this is a little confused here, but um, but we can profile browser, see what he's doing at least. So he's pit number 43. Oh, uh, profile for a while, and then I guess we'll stop there. And look at this. <laughs> looking good oh man we got a lot of implementation work ahead of us 
but it's pretty cool that we can actually load it at all. So I guess the, these are my uh, commonly used emojis scattered around. So what on earth are you doing? Let's uh, flip this upside down and then we can see that there is a lot of reed beer. Oh, holy moly, look at that. So the most time is actually spent in iterating our fonts directory. That's unexpected, but that's awesome that we learned that. So let me get a little note taker here. Um, profiling notes. Number one, the time spent uh, in uh, iterating uh, res fonts below um, style properties font. That is an extremely um, good data point. So we can definitely do less of that. Um, so I think what's happening is that we are, or actually let's let's not investigate immediately. Let's collect more data. So that's the director iterator in load font, yeah. Okay. And then we have an absolute path resolution. Uh, again, same here, load font. So both of those are taking us into the kernel um, and at least during initial layout. So we can do less of that for sure. Okay, and then we have split view. Um, okay, so selector matching. We're matching, uh, we're checking if a, an element has a given class. So, uh, and then in order to find all of the classes that apply to an element, we have to look at the uh, class attribute. And since you can have more than one class, it's actually um, like a space separated string, right? The class attribute. So you have um, some div class. Uh, you can have two classes, the foo and bar. And uh, we have to actually split this when we are doing selector matching because it might match this selector and this selector. So that's what that split is. And I think that's it's definitely very aggressive because it looks like we're doing that every time we run the selectors against an element, we do a string split uh, and we can definitely cache that uh, instead. So let's see. Um, selector engine let's see we can just say iterating okay. selector engine um, doing element as class which leads to um, string split view okay and then we have free freeing a lot of fly strings and again we are in has class Yeah, malloc creating a lot of strings, again, in has class. So it looks like has class is um, a real nasty boy here. Um, doing allocations, he's allocating a new fly string every time from a, um, from a raw C string. So, um, let's see, this API here is actually pretty crap because uh, we want to take advantage of fly string because we store um, on the selector we store the uh, selector value so the class that's in a selector we store that as a fly string so fly string is uh, globally unique and if you want to compare two fly strings it's just a pointer compare so it's a flyweight string class and we don't take advantage of that here because we instead, the has class API takes a string view. So um, has class takes a string view. So then when we call this, it gets really awkward because we have to, um, what are we doing here? We're comparing it here, right? So we don't realize that we actually have a 
flystrom that we could compare. And then, okay, so this, this stuff, we gotta fix this up. And then I think here we are doing, um, what is this attribute? This is probably that uh, fly string allocation that we saw. Creating a new fly string every time here. So this, if we would just cache a fly string for this, that would be a lot better. Okay, and then what else do we have? That's um, atomic locking business again in fly string. And the other one is director iterator. Uh, string length. Wow. I'm surprised to even see that in a profile. Uh, I don't want to see that one in a profile. Let's see. Why are you in a profile? String length. Um, it's a null check. Um, 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 um. Let's split view. String split view. Oh, oh, look at that. It checks length on every iteration, but it's not in line. So it turns into many calls. That's stupid. Um, I think we are gonna, we are gonna cheese that one immediately because we should never be in that situation. So we'll say is empty, always in line, length, always in line, characters, always in line. I think that's, that's fair. Probably more of these could be always in line, like bracket operator. Anyway, um, let me let me do that one separately here. So, ack, um, mark some popular string functions, always in line. <laughs> I don't want to see string length in a profile. Jeez. All right. Um, because the thing is, when, now that we mark it inline, I guess I should mention, when we mark it inline, the compiler uh, will be able to see that um, it's not gonna change here. So it will be able to hoist that um, check out of the loop, or it's not going not, not gonna to hoist the check, but it's going to hoist the call uh, because it is, um, the string is not going to become null here. I think. Okay, so then what else is going on? Selector engine matches. Yeah, so selector engine, of course, takes time. And then here we have a string view, creating a string view from a fly string. So I think that's just when we're doing the um, class check because we're converting our fly string to a string view. Now, maybe string view from fly string should be um, always in line as well. It's a bit weird that it's not. Oh, wait, it's in the CPP file. Okay, well, then we have no choice. Okay, well, let's not sweat this one too much because we're gonna get away from, from using a string view here anyway. Okay, and then more fly string construction. And then the disk cache in the kernel. I bet this is gonna be font lookup again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, now we're down in the weeds here. But this is very interesting. So uh, this profile was during uh, Twitter loading and um, two main interesting culprits here are iterating the fonts of the system and then um, looking up if an element has a given class during selector matching. That's interesting. Okay, and then let's see. Okay, so we have just um, hovering over the window has really high CPU usage as well. And it sticks, so let's grab a profile of that. See what's going on. Because, um, you know, I, if we're gonna, if we're gonna work on, on correctness here, uh, we have to fix this like obnoxious performance problems first. So it's a case of premature optimization actually being a useful thing, I 
think maybe I profiled for too long and this will crash the kernel. <laughs> Uh, yes, it did. Dang it. All right. Um, well, I guess we have enough here to go on. We can we can do a second profile after we've addressed some of these issues. So let's see. Maybe we'll start with the selector engine stuff. So um, an element element has class. So first thing we'll do is we'll make this thing take a fly string. Um, and I think that will work really nicely because when the selector engine calls uh, into has class, he already has a fly string anyway. So that's good. And then in the implementation here, so fly string, um, instead of looking this up this way, I'm thinking, why don't we get cheeky and um, pre-compute a set of fly strings. We pre-split. So when we receive the attributes from the parser, or, or when somebody sets an attribute on an element, so if somebody sets the class attribute, then we will always be here in parse attributes. So this function always gets called when an attribute changes on an element. So I guess we can call these name and value. Um, okay, and then if name so if name is class, and when we receive the class attribute, then uh, what we want to do is um, classes, or maybe call it class list, is uh, value split mm. Oh, how do we want to do this? Well, I guess we want to split it and then turn them into fly strings. So. We can really do a split view, uh, and we split at these, split at white space. That's good enough for now. And then um, we'll say class list uh, clear, and then we'll iterate. Um, we'll iterate the new class list and then we'll have it this will be the old class list we'll cache that um, on the element so we'll cache something like a vector of fly string class should we just call it classes that's kind of cool new classes um new class in new classes and then we can just say classes append new class. Okay. And actually, we can even do a clear um, clear with capacity maybe so that we don't reallocate or well, let's not get fancy. Uh, let's not get fancy here. But we can do ensure capacity with the exact capacity that we need at least. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, so now we will have a vector of fly strings containing all of our classes, which means that when you call has class, we no longer have to go and fetch the class attribute and split it. But instead, what we can do is just uh, iterate. Um, so we want to call this. Uh, Classes. This keyword is, is irritating, right? Um, okay. Well, I've used this before. It's, it's a bit goofy, but um, since I can't say class, or actually, wait, we have a convention. It's this. Um, the, um, somebody working on libjs. I don't recall who it was. Said that that this is a convention in some places. If you want to use a language keyword as a um, identifier, so I think I think it, it works. So we should stick to that because we've been using it in other places. Hum, 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 hum. So I guess what we have to do now is just um, iterate our classes and check if class equal class name return true. Okay, so that should be a much, much faster uh, has class. Because now we pre-split once uh, when we parse 
the DOM instead of doing it every time that we run a selector. Because we'll run the selector just like a million times and we'll parse the DOM like one time. And then of course you can dynamically change the classes, but still it's gonna be less, way less often than um, selectors run. So let's see, oh wait, we should, or we can make a new copy of the, so I was thinking we should make a copy of the, um, the downloaded version of my Twitter page. So let's do that. Um, mount, copy, mount, home oh, on, what do you call it? Tw.html. And then we'll just put it here. Let's make sure that we always have it. Uh, okay. So you have to rebuild everything because I was touching the um, ACK string headers. Okay, so I think that that was a pretty um, pretty good change for that. And obviously this bloats up element a fair bit, so it's not ideal to keep it exactly this way for the future. Um, there are various techniques that we can do to um, use less memory for this. One, um, one technique I know about is that we would um, figure out if our, um, if we have the exact same set of classes as some other element, and then we can point them both to a shared um, set. So we could have something like a, uh, like a class list object that is immutable and reference counted, and then any element that has the same identical set of classes could both point to the same class list object. And then uh, we would not have to store um, this set of classes with each element, but uh, like I was saying before, like let's not get fancy because um, we have we have so many other things to worry about right now. Uh, I just want to, I guess I just I, I really just want to get these like extremely pathological performance problems out of the way so that we can uh, work on other stuff without having to wait, you know, two three minutes just to to get to the page. Um, so this build is taking a while, but um, it's nice at least that that we got the um, CMake stuff working now. Um, I feel like I'm, at least I'm not babysitting the build in the same way that it was before, but that makes me a little bit uh, restless <laughs> while it's building because I, I don't I don't have anything to fiddle with. Um, I I mean we'll look at the next new profile again to see if we eliminated this problem. Uh, and then we can look at the font stuff as well. I suspect that um, the font stuff is probably mostly relevant when you first load a page and then um, it's less painful once you've loaded it because then everything will be in cache and uh, you're not gonna do these like whole um, rebuilds of style metadata, so... Um, but I'm not sure. We'll see. Anyways, it's uh, it's fun to to do a little bit of, of this type of work on the engine as well because I'm doing I'm doing a lot of parsing lately, right? And uh, doing a lot of JavaScript stuff. But uh, it's important to I think it's important to work on all fronts of the engine because it's so much more motivating if we make progress in every part of it regularly instead of like first we do this and then we do that. Just uh, do a little bit of everything. So can we open this Pajay? Okay, so protocol server definitely doing stuff. I guess I should get a profile of that. Protocol server is 26, uh, P26E. Okay, I'm getting a decent amount of profile. Let's see what it's actually doing. Flip. And what do we have here? Let's go to percentages. Okay, so uh, it's all in the big integer code. 
uh, we have divide without allocation and multiply without allocation, uh, sharing the brunt of the runtime. Uh, 42 plus 40 percent, so like 83 percent of runtime is in big int, divide, and multiply. Um, and these are flattened functions, so we don't know like what's going on inside of them, and it doesn't look like there's any particular hotspot. It's more like a bunch of hotspots. This is the the yellow here tells us that there's some percentage of time is spent on this particular instruction, right? Um, but I think we'll need some um, algorithmic improvements to the bigint library. Although this here, we do have 13, almost 14% in <laughs> debug put string. So it's like all that debug spam that's coming out here. We're actually spending almost 14% of actual runtime printing debug output. Uh, so that's probably something we could do less of. I wonder why that's so heavy. Probably because it, uh, I imagine it actually goes to QEMU and then QEMU has to uh, like write something to some file descriptor and then there might be some slowness there. Um, I wonder if we would if we would send debug output to a file from QEMU, uh, would this be as heavy? But anyway, I don't, I don't know exactly what to do about these right now off the top of my head, so I'm not going to go any further with that. But at least we have this loaded here. Let's see if we can scroll the page. Uh, oh, we actually can. That's pretty cool. Wow. Um, so... We have that CPU usage spiking there, but it does come back pretty quickly. Wow, rendering is rendering is a little bit goofed. <laughs> hmm. But at least we can we can get a profile of it to see what it is doing. Um, so let's see what is your PID, son? It is 25. All right, and then let's get some of that chunky CPU usage, see what it's doing on hover. Okay, and please tell me about yourself. Selector engine matches. So, okay, so we're still in selector engine matches but at least has class has moved down a bit. Um, element has class. Malloc, what are you mallocing about? We are still allocating fly strings in um, selector engine matches. I bet you we could do less of that. Why are we doing that? I mean, it's, it's definitely a lot less heavy than it was before, so this, this optimization helped a ton. Um, but who, are, who is calling that? Fly string compare, instantiate fly string, and then call element attribute. All right, so um, is it attribute selector? Hmm. Okay. So attribute value. Hmm. Wait. Has attribute. going on here. Okay, so you're calling fly string. The attribute name is a fly string. So attribute value is not a fly string. Oh, wait, 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 wait. It's going to be this one. Oh, look at that. ID. We are um, 
creating a flag string every time that we do any ID selectors. We can definitely do less of that. So let's see here. Let's first let's just turn this into a patch. So web um, cache. Uh, wait, hold on. Cache the set of an element has um, instead of doing a string split every time call element has class. Mm. Doing string splitting uh, instead of wait. <laughs> I have to use the optimum number of characters per line. Uh, we now cache the uh, we now uh, split the uh, class attribute value. Uh, when it changes and cache the parts, cache the individual classes as fly strings and element and classes. Um, this allows us to make, uh, this makes has class uh, uh, significantly. Um, significantly faster and moves the paint point of selector matching somewhere else. Uh, cache the set of classes an element has. That's it sounds so weird. Um, that element cache its set of classes, its, its list of classes, yeah. Okay, and then, so for something like this, where we have like a hard-coded ID, uh, or hard-coded identifier that we want to be able to use again and again, uh, because the ID attribute is obviously super common in, in a web engine. Um, it's stupid to create a fly string every time here. So we should really have, we should have a fly string on hand with this exact uh, thing. So let's see. Um, so in WebKit, this would be something like, oh, what's it called? It's like HTML names ID, I think. I think it's something like that. Um, and I'm thinking we should do something similar. So, um, maybe, um, maybe tag names, maybe. Tag names ID, that's pretty good. Tag names, we can put the namespace in there too, because we're going to need tag namespaces eventually anyway. Um, and then I want to put this in a separate file. So um, DOM tag names. Um, yeah. DOM tag names. Okay. And Namespace, web, namespace, tag names, namespace, HTML. We're going to auto generate this code um, eventually, but right now, uh, right now we won't. So, fly string. And then this will be a, um, I guess, an extern fly string ID. Um, and we would have class as well. Um, 
And you know, we, we could put all of the different attributes here that are interesting. Uh, these are not tag names. <laughs> Dang it, I messed this up. These are not tag names, these are attribute names. Um, hmm. These are attribute names. So maybe we should have attribute names as well. And attribute names, do attributes have namespaces? I don't think so. Okay, well, we're gonna move this to uh, attribute names. <laughs> Okay, and we'll call it attribute names. We should have a tag names as well, but that'll be something else. Pragma ones. Pragma ones. So this one would be something like, you know, like div HTML. Head, body, and so on. Um, but. Let's worry about this one right now, and then let's put... Hmm, gotta make sure that these are initialized. So let's have a function that um, static void initialize, uh, or just void initialize. And we'll have attributes names CPP. Yes, and then here what we'll do is web DOM attribute names. And in initialize, we will initialize these good boys. So ID is ID, I guess, and so on. Um, OS initialized. Um, okay, and then my thinking is that when we instantiate an HTML view, um, or when should we do this? I guess when we make in HTML view, we can do it. It's a little bit weird, but let's let's do it this way. So here we'll, or should we do it even deeper? Okay, we can do it when we create a document. Document is, is closer to the action. Let's do it here. HTML, uh, wait, attribute names, HTML. Initialize. I don't know. Maybe we'll come up with a better solution for this at some point. I just um, want to be able to refer to them globally right now. So then we should be able to say attribute names HTML id. Do we check for that in more places? I guess we can we can fix these up too. So attribute things, HTML good. Okay. And then here we have something to get element by it. We can teach him to do this as well. Attribute names, HTML, id. Yeah. That'll be a nice little improvement, I think. Let's see if we got rid of that string allocation in selector matching. By doing this, I think we probably will. Um, 
And then, I mean, then selector matching is just going to be slow because because Twitter has a lot of selectors and we are not an optimized selector engine yet. So, oh wait, where am I? But we gotta do one thing at a time here. So, get DOM, attribute names, CPP. Hmm. So this is a little bit of a weird video today, but I guess I, I just wanted to get into some, some dirty um, performance analysis and hacking, see what we could, what we could make of it here, because I thought it would be kind of interesting to work on. So let's open this guy, poof, and then of course, maybe we can, we can silence all of this debug spam. The um, TLS and crypto libraries, they're like very noisy, which probably probably make them less noisy. I mean, 13, 14% of runtime, that's a bit much. <laughs> um, but let's see, so browser. Oh, wait, what the heck just happened? My shell died because it has not pledged SIG action. Okay, well, I need to review some pull requests, I think. <laughs> but um, outside of that, I wanted to... Where is browser? Here. So, pig 25. Let's do a little bit of this. Okay. I'm just watching the CPU usage up here go up and then go down again, and then we can stop profiling and take a look at it. Okay, so flip that upside down, and we are still pretty heavy in Has class. But yeah, selector matching has is now taking over completely. Do we have any particular hotspot? I guess here, decrementing. Um, that'll be the um, loop over the selector components, I think, which is a backwards loop, which would explain the decrement. But let's just confirm that. So that's a simple selector. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Wait, matches simple selector does a deck. So it's. Simple selector. Hmm. I'm not sure why he does a deck here, actually. But I'm guessing that it got in line somehow. And where is it? It's probably this thing right here. Or one of these guys. Regardless, we can. We can get better at selector matching in a number of ways, uh, but they are a little bit higher level than um, than I want to get into right now. So let's see, has class. It's not optimal, but it is faster. We're just doing a lot of it, so that's okay. And then what's this string impl unref? But it's not particularly heavy, actually. It's like a percentage, so it's less than a percent here. So we're in the weeds. Um, and if we flip it the other way around, now we can see, actually, let me open up the whole tree here. We'll take a look. So it's a recursive style update. That's what's taken, taken all that time. And then, let's see, here is a pretty uninteresting tree. Uninteresting. Yeah, but, but essentially all of it is selector matching. Cool. So the font issue is completely absent here, I guess because uh, we were not capturing when that happened. So 
let's try again and profile the browser right when we started up. So PSEF, grab the, where are you browser? It's here, 39. Uh, and we'll enable that the moment that I kick off the load. So home and on Twitter HTML. Oh, <laughs> that didn't go well. Dang it. All right, all right, let's try again. Um, That did not go well either. Wait, is this gonna fail because of the ugh, because of the sig action thing? Uh, all right, all right, all right. Um, Forty-two. Just load pro. So I think now we're not actually capturing time in browser. This is all in protocol server. So I'm interested in what happens right after Protocol Server finishes downloading all of the resources and we actually get a chance to look at them. So now, essentially, browser takes over, so we'll disable, oh, wonder if we got too much. Um, nope, seems like we didn't. Okay, so what are you doing? Um, okay, so no font stuff. That's interesting. So we didn't do any font business this time. And the results look... No, they don't look different. <laughs> they just took a moment to come in. Okay. I thought that um, we broke something, but... Seems like put string is pretty heavy again. Why is it so heavy? Increment EDX. So I guess the real time is actually in this out instruction, which probably does synchronous something with QEMU. I wonder if QEMU has, um, it would be nice if they had an API where you could do uh, send something to the debug console without going like character at a time. Because if we could instead go, uh, you know, say like, hey, take this buffer and just spit it out in the debug console, that would be nice but it might also be a bit silly. I don't know. So we have a fair amount of malloc during load, but that's also to be expected because we are just doing, um, we're doing all kinds of parsing and laying out and stuff, line splitting. Uh, UTF-8 iteration. Looking a little bit um, busy there. Let's see, this is a profile of the loading times. It's pretty like varied. Let's only select this part here. Yeah, I guess I don't get the impression that this is particularly slow. And in fact, painting seems to not be much of an issue at all. It's just doing relay outs and stuff. Um, and the thing, the reason that it uses CPU now while I'm hovering is because I keep hovering something else and then it, it has to, uh, like now that you're hovering something else, then a different hover selector in CSS will apply to different elements and then we have to recompute the style for what gets invalidated and so on. Um, so, so we could probably do a lot of optimization to hover logic to get better at not doing uh, relay out and, and restyle and stuff just because you hover something. But I don't know, that font thing hasn't come back, so that's a little bit weird. Um, regardless, let's take a look at it to see what it's doing. Font. So when you call load font on a style properties, or hold on, let me commit the thing I was working on.
yeah, let me get rid of tag names. We can come back to that later. Good um, web. Um, all right. Add, add, add. Um, static or add global. Um, Global, global cached, global um, attribute name, fly strings. Uh, instead of creating fly strings, extremely common fly strings like id and class uh, on demand every time they are needed, um, we can now use now have uh, attribute names H uh, which provides web attribute names HTML ID class hmm do I like this do I like it mm. Attribute names. I feel like maybe we should have flipped those around. So it's web HTML attribute names. Because then we already have like web CSS. So that's a bit nicer, I think. Um, web attribute names HTML. We'll just flip it around. But yeah, I think that's pretty cool. And then of course I should have amended that to say like that. This um, avoids a uh, bunch of string allocations during selector matching. Mm. Wait, why does this not build? Element wrapper. Attribute, oh, I guess I have to go and change that one as well. Tag names does not exist. Why do you think that tag names is a thing? Did I not change the tag names, attribute names? Oh. Style properties, load font. So what do we do when we load a font? And what do we call load font anyway? We call load font when you ask for the font of a given set of style properties. All right. And then we look in our font cache to see if we have this font. If so, we return it. So we already have a font cache. We look it up by family and wait. Okay. Mm. We could definitely use fly string here just to reduce the um, cost of looking things up in the cache. Let's 
so okay, so our fallback string we can make our fallback string be but this wasn't exactly heavy in the first place. It was heavy in disk IO, so I don't wanna I don't want to do micro optimizations here that don't make sense. So we are here. We're iterating res font to look for a font file. Um, it's, I feel like this needs a bigger rework. I would really like to move this type of logic into libgui and then have libgui or maybe even libgraphics, but not libweb, but like to have a lower level graphics library go and um, take like a font name. So it would take like a, uh, you know, Helvetica bold or whatever, and then it would uh, resolve that against whatever fonts we have locally and then give you the closest match to that. Um, Cause I think, I think that's more of a generally useful thing that doesn't necessarily belong here. So since this is not appearing to be an issue, maybe I'll just chill on it. And instead we'll go and um, if we can go and reduce some of that debug spam, do some unglamorous stuff. So what was this? This all of this spam here, like could not read the certificate. Who's saying this? I mean, it's libtls, but um, this could clearly clearly be in the debug category. So do we have tls debug, right? So. I think we could put all of these in TLS debug and then my friend Ali who wrote the TLS can go and turn this on and work out his fix me's uh, or someone else can maybe I will but since it's taken up so much time to actually to actually even use this Message validity. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, let's see if, if some of that reduced the spam a little bit. remote session ID abrupt closure I'm seeing a lot of these the server is a jerk well, I believe you but still seeing a lot of them finished mm. So I think I think the um, the path forward to debugging this stuff is to go in and like run it with TLS debug enabled, but it's like it's too noisy for uh, always being on. Because if you want to have this type of thing always on, then it needs to be a little higher signal, a little lower noise. I think. Let's do those remote session ID. Um, what do we have? Record length more. Cipher colon.
Okay, starting to calm down a little bit in the sides. Um, I don't know where these are coming from. I guess it's some debug printf somewhere in the PLS. Yes, PLS V. 12.h debug printf print buffer. This should not be static. Um, who uses these? Oh, I see they were part of this stuff. Um, 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 um. seeing some other weird stuff going on. We have a crash. Where are we crashing? Hmm. Crashing in null pointer deref in malloc below crypto hash manager initialize. Ensure hmac. Hmm. Hash manager initialize. Now, why you, would you be crashing in um, no point to deref in malloc? That smells like um, like malloc heap corruption to me. Um, I guess we can take a look at malloc to see what's going on at that particular address. Let's look in um, protocol server. Oh wait, I have to. I have to look here. I forgot that we switched to CMake with a build directory. So it'll be here. And then we'll look for this address. And what is going on here? It's after creating a chunk block and appending it to uh, appending it to the list of chunk blocks. Yeah. So it's right at the end of uh, one allocation path. Uh, okay, so I'm guessing that um, the malloc metadata metadata has been corrupted somehow, and there's a null pointer somewhere. Uh, so I don't really have the facilities to debug this easily, but. I think I'll just leave that one alone right now. Um, let's try one more time. See if we can load. It's interesting that we're doing all of these DNS lookups here for the same um, address, but lookup server has a cache, so it's not taking any time or anything. Okay, we've got a crash again. Now we are crashing in the protocol server, another null deref, now in 
download clear. I'm getting a, the distinct impression that we have heap corruption in the uh, HTTPS implementation, which is probably not good. But it's also probably debuggable. It's just um, just not where where we are right now. So come on, come on and load. I bet you that I changed the timing of a lot of stuff now. So if there's any kind of race here, then I'm, I'm messing with the timings. So what's going on? Protocol server, very, very busy. Why are you so busy? What are you doing? Let's see. Wait, what is it doing? Something looks um, sketchy here. Let's see, pid 31. Okay, so we're fetching a lot of randomness. And wait for event. Why does he call that? Rand. There's no randomness here. Okay, so we're selecting. Why are we selecting, I wonder? I mean, presumably, um, Something is readable and then we're not handling it correctly. So what would that be? It would be either one of these is readable. We're not taking care of that, but these are all like standard IO, so I don't think it's that. So these are writable. Uh, I could imagine that we are learning that this particular TCP socket here, which is an HTTPS connection, uh, it's writable and the event loop is probably noticing that, sending out a notification, and then nobody does anything with the notification. But uh, that's a whole other issue. Okay, anyways, I think uh, I think we're going to end the investigations here for today because uh, it's becoming very scattered, but I think we still got some, some good things done. And um, let me just verify that I'm not messing this up. It looks fine, 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 fine. I'm just, uh, I, hope, I hope that none of these are effectful, but I don't think that they are. Oh yeah, and then we were doing our little thing here with um, changing the attribute names namespace. So this one goes in the previous commit. Get add click, get commit amend, and then we can do the font cache thing with that, use a uh, fly string in font cache keys, because why not? Um, oh, RSA, maybe that one shouldn't have been TLS debug, but rather crypto debug. Let's just commit this with crypto, put some debug spam behind crypto debug, and you too, libtls, put some debug spam, put uh, lots of debug spam behind tls debug. All right, so yeah, I, I, think, I think we got some good stuff done. Uh, we definitely improved the performance of selector matching. We got a bunch of profiles and saw some interesting things. Um, we found a lot of crashes in, <laughs> in the HTTPS implementation, which we need to investigate. But 
Uh, those will all be their own little things. Let's see if we can load the official website just once. I wonder what all these are. Event type, no receiver. Why did we crash? Hmm. Null pointer down download again. Very suspicious. Hmm. Okay, well maybe he doesn't want to right now. Oh, here's another one. Byte buffer grow crashing in malloc again. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to end the video here, but um, if you made it this far, then I thank you for watching and for hanging out, and I hope that you saw something interesting. This was uh, a little bit different than the recent videos. Now we're just going into performance land, uh, highly premature performance optimizations, but very necessary to make this, you know, debuggable and usable at all for development. So thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you next time. Bye.